Okay. okay. I'm uh, Stephanie Gieslin. I'm here talking with Dr. Tom Livendahl at Livendahl at his home at 3173 North 50th Street. Today is July 11th, 2017, and it's about 930, 9 15. 10 10, exactly. It's on my cell phone. 10. Oh, yeah, we can 10. On, Sorry, it is 10 10 on my cell phone. On July 17th, to yeah. the, or July 11th, 2017. We'll get that right at the end. 7 um, 11 to 10. Yes, that's, <laughs> there you go. that's okay, how I remember it. Um, before we continue, can I get your oral consent to continue with the interview, Dr. John? You have my consent. All right, thank you so much. Um, so we'll get started. I guess um, let's just start by getting a little background about you. If you could tell us um, maybe where you were born and about growing up. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a native Chicagoan. Okay, I was born in Chicago. Uh, at Swedish Covenant Hospital on the north side of the city. The birthing doctor was my uncle, <laughs> Dr. Richard Liffendahl. So he patted me on the tush, welcomed me in the, wor in the world, and uh, told my mother that he was going to be at least six feet or over. He was wrong, but at least I survived my uncle Rick telling me that I was going to be stretched. Um, my experience in Chicago, it's, it's interesting. I was, Milwaukee and Chicago are kind of the same in many ways. Milwaukee is a diminished version of the city of Chicago. It's laid out like Chicago, but everything is reversed. And I lived on the north side, which would be, the, well, close to Rogers Park, that area of the North Andersonville, if you know where that is, on the north side of Chicago. And I lived there until I was about 11 years old, went to public schools. Um, my parents uh, wanted a bigger place. We had a three flat that my dad had inherited. Uh, the, flea, the three flat no longer exists. It was raised because of urban change in the city of Chicago in the 19... 40s, 30s, 40s, we, that was a very prime area, 4627 North Kenmore. It was a very prime area, but in the 1950s and 60s, with the great migration of people from the south into Chicago, these were not black folks, these were Appalachian whites. And uh, the, the house was sold so my parents could move down to the south side of Chicago which would be the equivalent of Sherman Park and into Beverly Morgan Park, an area on the south side of Chicago. So I was born on the north side, raised on the south side. And so you do the same thing with Milwaukee. Oh, you were born at St. Anthony's and then you were... So you, you get this sort of same vibe that happens with Chicago and Milwaukee. The difference, though, is in size and scale. Uh, so I grew up on the south side, went to public high school, was very involved in ROTC. Uh, turned out I became, uh, for about three years, a competitive shooter, marksman, shooter. Uh, 20, and I go, okay, four position, 22, 50 foot indoor gallery, Olympic style shooting. And the, that was my sport. My sport was not football. I was too small. <laughs> uh, it wasn't baseball. I was too slow. Shooting was perfect for me. So um, the end result was that uh, I, I was prof proficient at that, was well-versed uh, and exposed to teaching partially through ROTC in high school because I ended up teaching certain classes in junior and senior years. And I enjoyed it. I liked doing that. So I'm, I'm, my mother is a high school art teacher, uh, chair of her department. She's, she's passed. And my dad was an art professor at the Art Institute of Chicago. And he taught at the end of 32 years of teaching graduate level painting and drawing. And so I was exposed to the art community in Chicago um, very much into Old Town in Chicago, that sort of thing. So my background was mixed. It, you know, okay, how do we find, define ourselves? Well, almost all Americans 
will say that they're middle class, okay, that is either by income, intellect, or education, but generally speaking, uh, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, but we were very well educated and exposed to a lot of culture. So I graduated from high school in 1963. I, and this, I went directly into the Marine Corps. Within two weeks of graduating from high school, I was in boot camp. Received my draft notice in boot camp, which everybody, including my drill instructors, thought was hilariously funny because in 63, the Vietnam War was kicking in. And so the draft would be re reinstituted. And I was trained in the Marine Corps as a voice radio operator. So this electronic stuff I was exposed to very early. And the uh, I spent about a year and a half in California uh, near Santa Ana, El Toro Marine Corps Air Base. Uh, and then I had to pull an overseas tour. And that was just normal in 64 and 65. 65 I went overseas, which meant I went to Okinawa and I was in an anti-tank unit, which is very different than the air wing. The air wing for the Marine Corps is like being a civilian in the Air Force. The the uh, Antos unit, the anti-tank unit I was in, was a combat unit. And so I was the radioman for that platoon of five vehicles. I had to maintain and adapt and fix all the equipment and maintain communications, that sort of thing. Within three months of being on Okinawa, we were shipped out to Vietnam. And that was an interesting experience because the first time we, it was called mounting out. When you mount out, you load your equipment aboard ship and you're ready to go. Normandy invasion, whatever. So we mounted out once they said, fine, you guys seem to know what you're doing. They let us back in Okinawa, mounted out about a month later the second time, and off we went to South Vietnam. They didn't tell us that. So the experience was, I, I partially was humorous, at least going down there, because we're sailing from Okinawa, which is a southernmost, one of the southernmost islands of Japan, and we're going to Vietnam, which is through the tropic zone, down to a place called Chulai, Da Nang, Chulai. And at the time, this is the very beginning of the Vietnam War. Gulf of Tonkin had only occurred about six months before. Uh, generally speaking, the Vietnam War wasn't on anybody's consciousness. This, I was one of the very first regular Marines going to Vietnam. And so we landed at a place called Chulai, which was sand dunes. Think of the Indiana dunes, and you load off of a, a launch or a, the U boat, they're called. You land, and we are mental. Is I like telling funny stories about this because the other stories I don't like telling so much. But the the preconception of a whole bunch of 19, 20 year olds who were aboard that ship was having watch. Victory at Sea. Victory at Sea was a series on television in the 1940s, specifically the 50s uh, and the early 60s that talked about the victory in the Pacific and the Pacific War. Also, it talked about the Normandy invasion. And so the image you have in your mind, I'd never made a wet landing. I had no idea what, you know, I kind of knew what we were doing, but I'd never made a wet landing. So the, the vision I had was frankly of a film clip of British soldiers landing on the landing craft, the front gate going down, and these guys with the little pie plates helmets are all rushing off with packs in their backs. That's the image I had in my mind. And of course, the Germans were not happy they were there and they were shooting them down and all the rest of that. So our image, we had been told nothing, our image was we were going to do Tarawa, Iwo Jima. We were going to do a wet landing opposed. And so my assumption was we were going to get shot. So the image I have of myself is this 20-year-old kid, steel pot in my hand, um, flak jacket. I'm wearing a flak jacket. And uh, I have my trusty 45 automatic, which was a piece of junk. And I polished all my bullets because we didn't know what else to do. And we land, but we land, which I found out later, about a week before we touched, before we landed, Seabees had gone in. And the Seabees were beginning the process of building an, 
an, a runway, right, which would eventually take B-52s uh, in length. But there was nothing there but sand dunes. But in the middle of the sand dune that we were looking at, uh, F-4 jets, Phantom jets dropping bombs. In the, you know, we, we think we're doing a, a, an opposed landing. And the gate goes down. So we're in a, a boat, which, okay, we're in our pavilion here in the back of my yard. And that's about 10 feet, what, seven, eight feet tall, the height. Well, the, the, the gunnels of a U-boat are about that high, so you're in a tunnel, right? I'm sitting in my Jeep ready to, to land. The gate goes down, and up ahead, we land, we, we scrape metal, and the metal is the pier, a pier that the, the CBs had built. And so the gate goes down, scraping sound, we look forward, expecting bullets to be... No, there isn't any. There's all these CBs who are walking around in shorts. Look like surfers, right? And the surfers say, hey, Marines, glad you made it, you know. Glad you came. Welcome. You know, they had a sign up there, welcome, third Marines. It was, it was just, oh, we're so embarrassed. How embarrassed were we? Well, we were so embarrassed that when we landed, the, the Antos, think little tanks right, little track vehicles, little Caterpillar track vehicles. Um, and the Antos started, we spent the day pulling out trucks from the sand because they were like little tractors. And finally, they told us to go inland. We went about three miles inland up the coast. And if you go, you can, you can do a, a Google Maps and find Chulai, and you can see that the highway, Highway 1, which is goes from Hanoi to Saigon, right down the coast, we went across the highway and spent the night, that first night, in a French bunker with, with painted on there, you know, Vive la France, Vive la Résistance, all the stuff saying that this was World War II. You know, and we're going, what the heck are we doing here? Why are we here? What is going on? And my whole experience in Vietnam for seven months and then out, I, I had a hernia and then came back and, and another, another three months in, in Vietnam was this, why are we here? And so my feelings about the whole thing were a no one had which I find fascinating because I'm a, I'm a professor I'm a naturally a teacher, and at the time why didn't they talk to us about Vietnamese history why didn't they tell us about Vietnamese culture why weren't we at least in, the the first Vietnamese we talked to spoke fluent French a ma a man in his fifties who would be an old old man came up to us and asked us, were we the, were we the French returning? All round eyes look alike to, to this old man. We were the French returning. And we're going, eh, eh. We really didn't understand what we were involved doing. And you can see it all the way through to 1975, the same problems. We really didn't understand. We had the foggiest idea what we were doing. All right, so I'm out of the Marine Corps in 66. Um, I, I go to Rockford College in, well, I go two years at a junior college to save money because I'm putting, I'm paying my way through school. GI Bill wasn't worth very much. It was about $125 a month. Didn't pay for books, didn't pay for anything. And so, uh, I either work my way in the summer or whatever, but for two years I went to, uh, junior high or junior, uh, JV called, uh, Thornton Junior College in Harvey, Illinois. And it was fine, two years, got all my prerequisites out. And then chose to go to a small liberal arts college, uh, Rockford College in Rockford, Illinois. I'm on the alumni committee. I've been active with Rockford ever since, simply because the, the issue I had, now remember, it's now 1968, 1969, the height of the protest era. Mm -hmm. Madison is burning, mm -hmm. right? The campuses are crazy. Even UWM was going crazy. Marquette was having problems. All the schools in, in Wisconsin and Illinois were having problems. My cousin, who was training to be a medical doctor, he, he screwed up his career because the, the campus was not happy. The administrators were not happy because uh, they were aiding the protesters. And, they, and in Madison, remember, they blew up a building 
in Madison. So my cousin screwed up his medical career. He became a pathologist. I think he's much happier as a pathologist. He never gets arguments from his patients. But anyway, the, the issue that you have for me was I didn't want to get involved in protest because in the, I'm, I'm, I'm now 21. Basically, I'm hot-headed. I would get angry. I was not happy with what was going on. And I said, if I go to a protest or someone does something stupid, you know, I, I'll just get into trouble. I didn't want to do that. So the little, little liberal arts college was perfect. Sanctuary was perfect for me for the last two years. I graduate in 70. Um, I, uh, I am married the day after I graduate. Uh, and I have three beautiful daughters as a result of this marriage. And the, for the first six years, from 70 to 76, I teach. I'm teaching at a place called Oak Hill Academy in Mouth of Wilson, Virginia. And everybody goes, where is that? Well, the easiest way of saying it, if you Google Oak, Oak Hill Academy, Mouth of Wilson, Virginia, you would see it's the preeminent seed farm for NBA players. And, and in a way, what happened was this is a little private school, Southern Baptist School, in the mountains of the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia, on the western end of the state. And so I go near Freeze, Virginia. What's that? For, you know, Friendship? No, I don't know. I show you on a map, and it's about two miles from the North Carolina border. It's not far from Bristol, Tennessee. But the benefit of that school was we were, uh, my wife and I at that time were uh, living parents. We, we were dorm parents. We had students from as far north as New York, black students as far north as New York, and we had as far south as Indonesia. So this was a very interesting mixture of high school students. The, the key thing was we were isolated in the mountains there. We were self-sustained in many ways, and the kids all lived on campus, and it was a, a very safe environment. Uh, many uh, many kids with urban problems, this sort of thing, drug gangster prob gang problems, they were sent to Oak Hill. It, was like, it wasn't like Lincoln School or whatever they call it today here in Wisconsin, but it was really a, a very good education and a protective environment. So we did that for about seven years, and then I fried. I got burned out because it was a 24-7 job, right? You, you never left it. It was just constantly doing this. And I came back up to, the, the, the uh, in essence, A, I couldn't raise a family of three daughters, and my wife wasn't working on the salary I was making, I had to figure out a new career. So we moved back to Chicago, and through my family, I was able to get a job uh, at an ad agency because I had an art background, and I have a master's degree in educational technology, which is all this equipment stuff and how to use it. Um, I segued it, which is something all of, here, subtle hint, both of the people I'm talking to are twenty somethings, and I have news for you. You got seven careers ahead of you in forty years of work, so you better be prepared to switch careers. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went through this this process of trying to find my new feet, and I gravitated towards the graphic arts. I worked as a print production manager for two, three different advertising agencies. Eventually, became uh, a sales rep for Minnesota Mining. I was what was called a web publication specialist who was trained by 3M to go in and sell products for, the, for printing presses, mostly uh, plates and proofing and uh, chemistries and stuff like that. And so I did that. I did that for about three years, got another job. Again, you're switching jobs. You guys will switch jobs like on the average five years. Every five years, I was switching jobs. Uh, trying to jack up my salary. That was basically it because my wife wasn't working. I had three kids, mortgage, all the rest of it. So I was trying to increase income. And the end result was I worked for ad, ad agencies. I worked for a couple of training companies. Uh, and I started rediscovering my original love, which was teaching. Okay. 
So in sales, I didn't particularly like having to fight sales managers in order to jack up numbers to make all the, uh, the all the big wigs happy with the income. I was more happy working with my customers and teaching them how to use product, that sort of thing. So I said, that's what I like to do. And so uh, in 19, to, to cut this down, in 1995, I went back to school. So I already had a bachelor's which was in history and art. I had a master's degree in instructional technology with a minor in political science, and then I ended up going to Northern Illinois University. I, I had been divorced. My kids were all grown. I said I have a chance to restructure my career, and I went for a doctorate in adult continuing education, which is what I got my doc in with a, a cognate in human resource development. So. I go, to, I go to Northern, I'm there from 1991 to 1995, I'm a full-time student, I bite the bullet, I did the doc in three years, and then it took a year to do the research, and then I moved on. I came to Milwaukee uh, in 1996. My, my partner, Judy, and I are not married, we have been together for 20 years, that's her choice, not mine. And so the issue that we both had made it, I met her doing the doc, and Judy and I decided whoever gets the first job <laughs> will go to wherever the job was. And the job was here in Milwaukee at Cardinal Stritch University, and I was hired to be the curriculum director for the College of Business, and I was also uh, going to teach. And so I come up here, and I've been with Stritch ever since now, which would be 1990, basically 96 to the present day in various positions. And I have taught, I recently for the last three years, I've been teaching for Mount Mary in their justice program. So I have this, I have now my experience in Milwaukee. When I came up here, um, we looked, for, I wanted to live in a place that was close to where I had grown up in Chicago, which is a, 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 an area called Beverly Morgan Park. And if you looked at the history of Beverly Morgan Park, it is the history of the Sherman Park Community Association in Sherman Park. It's a, it's a mixed race, uh, homosexuals, LGBT, everything in one form or another. This is the 1950s, so a lot of it was not rainbow coalition yelling and screaming but it was a very welcoming community and so when we came up here I queried all my friends at, at Stretch I was living in Whitefish Bay in an apartment when I first came here and they said well you could go to Washington Heights you could go to Sherman Park and so I had them drive around and I liked Sherman Park I didn't you know we could have lived in Wauwatosa? We could. I said no. I want to live in the city, and part of it was in the back of my mind. I said, well, I want to live in the city because of residency, and I you know I might get hired by the city. I might do because I was still trying to figure out fully what my transitions would be. So and I didn't want to drive far. I'm used to Chicago, which is okay. We got to get groceries, so it takes an hour and a half to drive someplace. So I don't want that. I want you know Milwaukee's great. So. We move here, and eventually we rent property about a block from here, a two-flat about a block from here. And then this house became available, I, I, it had to be about 2000, 2001. So we've been in this house 14, 15 years. And the, for us, the, the community, if we talk about Sherman Park now, the community is, is welcoming, the community is uh, in transition and has been in transition, whatever transition means, for the last 40 years. So this was the area you're, you're in right now was all middle management people. Uh, this was the time when the economy was, was growing and prospering in Milwaukee <clears throat> and a lot of your middle managers were living in this community. Sherman Park used to be an independent village, and as typical with a lot of the neighborhoods in Chicago or in Milwaukee, they were acquired by the city over time. And so Sherman Park is part of that. 
Um, now, what? Tell, tell me, give me questions or at least guidance. I can babble on forever, but the the issue is, what are you looking for? Sure. Um, well, we'll go forward from there. But I I was really interested, I guess, when you compared Sherman Park to um, the area that you Beverly go Morning Park. Beverly Morning Park on right. the south side of Chicago, and you went in a little bit into um, how the demographic of the community was similar, and um, I was wondering, I guess, if there's anything else just about this neighborhood and that one that just felt similar to you. How, like, why, besides the demographic, when you came to Sherman Park, did you feel like it was similar to going home in Beverly Morning Park? Well, the physically, the size of the buildings, they're different. In Chicago, they're mostly brick, not land and stone. And they're, the Chicago bungalows are dominant. Um, the property that, that I lived in as a kid, uh, I think that house was built in 1895. So it was a wood frame house, uh, full screen porch, that sort of thing. So low to the ground, big boulevards, trees, that sort of thing. So that appeals to me. When uh, we looked at this house, the, the house, well, other than the fact that we love the architecture of the building, I mean, this architectural plan is common, but it isn't overridingly common. You can find the same house up the street. So when this house was built, which would be 32, the, I think the house up the street, which is almost the same design, was built in 32, and then the fill-ins all were the 50s and 60s. So the original, this, the, the building here, Land and Stone building, uh, with two duplex, again, 19, I think that place was built 19... I'm going to guess 1940, but these houses were solid. The German carpenters. I went upstairs. I mean, you don't want to go upstairs, but that's storage for us. But if you go upstairs and you pulled up the the floorboards and just looked at the inner construction of the the archways and the framing and all, it's this this house is like a rock. You know, yeah. it's really well built, old timber, that sort of thing. So that reminded me a lot. the The housing reminded me of where I lived. The type of people reminded me of the community I grew up in. Um, the next door neighbor, when I lived in, when I was a kid, lived in Beverly. The next door neighbor was a man named Red Blackford. He turned out to be the executive director of the Beverly, Beverly Area Planning Association. So, the association, the the community service part was something I saw as a kid and then when we came up here. Now, if I've got a doc in adult continuing education, but from Northern Illinois University, that university faculty, schools and the faculty are one and the same. The faculty is the school. That is a very, um, not postmodern, feminist-based, um, populist in nature, uh, uh, very... <clears throat> what would be the right term, uh, avant-garde in the sense of political. Uh, it, it was a, a hotbed of the, all the faculty members were all very involved in social justice and change. And so the, the, my experience and Judy's experience with both doing our docs was that we had to be in some place where we could be politically active. So when we came to Milwaukee, when we got this place, I started asking around, is there an associate? And they said, yes, go see Gretchen. So we went to the, the association on Fond du Lac and instantly became members. And eventually, I think within three years, I was on the board. And I think in a year, I was the, exec, I was the vice president. But the issues of this community, is, is, I always talk about scale if I'm talking. Why should you live in, in Sherman Park would be a, a question that one would ask. The, <laughs> yeah, and the, 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 the question is scale. <clears throat> Milwaukee, for all its dysfunction and for all of Wisconsin's political dysfunction, um, is a amenable place to live because the scale is such, if you want to get politically active, you can't. And you can do it through your neighborhood organizations. 
I don't want to run for mayor. I have no desire to run for alderman, although my name has been put forward to be on the Fire and Police Com Commission. I don't know if that will ever happen. I've done research for the uh, police department. I've taught at the police academy. I have done stuff that in one way or another have been pro-cop in the sense that I, I, I care about training and development within law enforcement and now I'm teaching within that venue. But the the issues for me was I can actually do that. I can I can get involved and and I don't have to give up my own autonomy and I don't have to pledge allegiance to some political party. So I've enjoyed that. And so Sherman Park basically for me has enabled us to live in, in a relative relatively quiet neighborhood uh, with relatively low crime. Everybody, if you go to Waukesha, Walk Wauwatosa, any any of the suburbs, and Judy, my, Judy and I are active on the Ice Age Trail. I'm her minion. I'm purposely not a member of the Alliance. That's her thing. That's her Alliance membership. But when you go out to the suburbs, you, you can see how how the reality of what they think is going on in Milwaukee and what Milwaukee is are two different things. So, you know, I have this, hopefully I've, I, I, I have sunk roots into the community and I've been pretty much accepted, even though I am not born and bred at St. Joe's Hospital. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm accepted in the community and uh, have thoroughly enjoyed living here. Yeah. Um, do you think that you could, I think that was really interesting what you said about um, maybe the misconceptions of Sherman Park that people from suburbs like Wauwatosa might have. Um, if there, if there was something that you could show, like if you had someone that was coming in from one of those suburbs who might have preconceived notions of this neighborhood, Driver. what was it that you would want to show them? The neighborhood them? itself. Yeah. I my children live um, in no not Chicago proper. They live in the southern suburbs of Chicago. All three of my daughters live pretty close to each other, <coughs> and my five grandchildren. And they come up here. And my my oldest daughter, who lives in uh, Brookfield, which is where the Brookfield Zoo is, mm -hmm. uh, she comes up and says, "God, I love this house." And so I have my kids come up and, you know, they, they look at the house and just say, boy, I wish we could have this house. And I said, yeah, if you could pick the house up and drop it in a Chicago suburb, the house would be worth a quarter of a million dollars. It'd be worth a big chunk of change. And so the, the point is the, this community provides opportunities for housing. Now, they're, they're, again, everything in, in Milwaukee is smaller scale. But they're very similar to uh, Chicago. You can drive within 10 blocks, the neighborhood is one type. In 10 more blocks, the neighborhood completely changes. And you do another neighborhood and it completely changes. So this, this neighborhood, it, the scale is smaller. Within two or three blocks, you've got an Orthodox community. You have people in black Orthodox clothes walking around. You know, they're... they're wonderful people, gaggles of kids. It's a quiet neighborhood. Uh, they're praying all the time, so I know life, nothing's gonna happen to us because they pray a lot. And uh, the issues the, for the rest of the community are these, are, these are all people like me. It doesn't matter what your race is, the value sets are pretty much the same. And then you, but you go, you, you go east, okay? You go east of like, I'm also on the bid. I'm on the Beverly, or the, Burleigh, uh, the bid board for Burleigh and uh, bid 27. And uh, so our concern is, you know, like making Burleigh more viable, more economical, so on and so, so forth. So the from Burleigh, our, our bid venue is from 60th Street East to about 35th Street, all on Burleigh. And so the, the what you see is you... You, you go, St. Joe's is the anchor, so you see automotive places and smaller stores, uh, the farther east you go. And some of those stores have caused problems. And the problem is, the again, typical in Milwaukee, 
the 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 predominance of uh, two flats, Polish two flats, and and various rental properties has has caused the majority of problems. Both of these are the owners are absentee, but the owners are very good. Both both duplexes and side by side to us. Uh, if I was younger, I would have bought both of them. But I'm too old now to want to worry about caring for that property. But the people in the rentals are fine. Mm -hmm. And so the the street itself draws certain kinds of people in here. Now you go east and you got problems. And like I said, I, I work with the cops. I'm very aware of what where crime occurs. I'm very aware of the drug problems, the the, the issues of security in in. Uh, this community are the same as they would be in Chicago, but the main thing is what what causes problems for us? Burleigh, 51st Street. They're corridors, they're free movement corridors, and they can't really be slowed down because of ambulance needs and all the rest of this. And so w if we have criminal problems in the community, they don't come primarily from people here. It's either east or it's people going from the east side doing, you know, dealing drugs, going out to the suburbs or suburban people, which we've had problems with, coming in to buy drugs here in the community. And so the the Sherman Park Community Association is aware of that. We work with the district police. Uh, there's a number of other private groups that are doing as much as we can, you know, uh, to keep communication going. Okay, so I'm again. I have a tendency to babble. You got to bring me back. That's great. That was all wonderful. Um, actually, that is something that um, I think has been a theme I've heard a lot about from the different people whose homes we've been in and spoken to. Um, that there seems to be a pushback against tenancy, against renters in the neighborhood. Everyone wants to see the houses on their street be sold to. Um, single families that are going to live there for a oh, yeah. and, and they don't want renters. There seems to be kind of a, a divide there. Um, it's not also, rent. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop yeah, you there. Yeah, it's not that. renters per se. It's absentee landlords. Oh. See the tradition. Oh, the tradition in Milwaukee was, uh, I can't afford to build my house, so in essence, I'm going to build the first floor and roof it with a flat roof. Ah, I've got more money. I'm going to go up another story, and I'm going to put a regular roof on it. And so I'm going to rent the property above me, and I'm going to live at the bottom, or I'm going to live at the top and rent the bottom. But all these duplexes in Milwaukee, these Polish, that's why they're called Polish, they're immigrant, they're immigrant housing. And a lot of them were built so that you could, in essence, leverage income to finish the building. Now the problem is, just like in Chicago, or any urban area, as the as in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, during that period of white flight in most urban areas, the white flight left behind all these properties that were bought up by either very good people or very bad people on speculation, and they were going to rent the properties out. Milwaukee has had the bad luck of having significant numbers of absentee landlords who have bought up 150 properties on sheriff sales and then they milk them. And so what happens is they don't invest. They don't invest in the community and they are, because of property rights, they are able to uh, suck economic benefits out of their communities and the people who are left behind are, are, in a way, not defenseless, but they're, they're, if you're a property owner, you have problems because now all of a sudden the renters they're renting to are, are only in the property six months. So you're cycling through families. There's a family up the street here who the owner was an older gentleman who had died and... Uh, his family doesn't didn't want to move into the property, so they kept the property, and they've been renting it. And so the the family and my dog walks as I walk the dog a lot in the neighborhood. The that family was evicted, and there was an eviction sign, 
and now they're back, which means they must have coughed up money to pay for rent or whatever, but they were allowed back into the building. So this is the problem you've got. The north side of Milwaukee, I think, is more dominant than the south side of Milwaukee with impoverishment, and a lot of the people who are living on the margins are all the ones that, what was that name of the new book on, on um, rental, oh, the the eviction rental cycle. There's a, a new sociolo a sociology book out that talks about the recurring problems, the never-ending problems of renting eviction, renting eviction, and never being able to get enough money together to buy anything. <clears throat> I can't think of the book. Um, but the, so I put the blame not on residents in the community. I think most people, if you have children, just want a safe community to raise their kids in. The problem you've got is the landlords who own the property can sour a whole block by renting to one bad family. And there's, I mean, one example is quote unquote, I'm not sure if that is their correct name, but there's a family uh, on the north side here called the Love Family, L-O-V-E. And cops have had never ending problems, drug house, uh, cousins, grandma, the place is owned by grandma, but it's all full of family members who are dealing drugs and there's constant problems. So the, you know, this is what you get. You get one good block with a block club formed because of one bad house and that block club spends huge amounts of energy to get the city to vacate it. But what you're doing is like the cops calling you're doing whack-a-mole because the mm -hmm. people move, they'll move someplace else and rent a product, keep doing what they've been doing because it's what they know how to do and they keep ending up screwing up neighborhoods. And so, I mean, here, I'll give you one story. Uh, one of the things I tried to do is I'm friends with the chief of police in Racine. And it turned out about, oh, I guess 10 years ago, I was teaching a graduate course um, in Kenosha. And one of my students was the deputy chief of Racine was now retired, but you know, he was a chief in, in another department. But he came up to me and said, I want to do my master's. It was a, a ma I teach mostly capstones, master's classes. So I'm, they got, he came up and asked, could I do my uh, paper on community policing? And I said, sure. And he was surprised because he said, you know what community? Yeah, I know what community policing is because I worked with the police department. And so that got me an invitation to go down to Kenosha and meet with the chief and get a tour for a, a system that, that that police department has instituted called community or cop houses, community-oriented policing houses. And the concept was a very simple concept. All right, we have in Milwaukee a number of properties that the city owns. What do you do with these properties? Well, you want to turn them. You want to rehab them and turn them and get people living in them. The problem is they're not in good neighborhoods. So Kenosha had this, or Racine had the same problem. And uh, one cop came, an innovative police officer came up with an idea. Uh, he started out by living in an apartment building on the first floor near the door. He just moved in. And he, he the whole tenure of the apartment building, because that basically became his beat. And the, the tenure of that building changed instantly. It just started becoming functional again. So they said, well, why can't we do this in the neighborhood? So what they did was to uh, go into select neighborhoods, rehab a house. Most of them had attached garages and the house became a cop house. And the way they made it financially viable was that the house in, in Racine is on, run by two special cops, two specialty cops, who are uh, kind of, it's a career path for them. And they run the house as a business. And they rent property or their rooms in the house to corrections, to parole, to the DA to 
so you have a one-stop shop in that neighborhood for people to go to and so by strategically locating these houses you create a zone of safety around them which for them I think on the average is about a 10 block radius and everybody knows if there's a problem go to the cop house and so the cop house now is sacred no one wants to give up their cop house because the original concept was you build the cop house you bring security to the neighborhood you take the cop house and you sell it and move two or five blocks over and do another cop house and so you can see in a checkerboard concept you're you're moving they're not satellite police stations they're they are onto themselves and you're moving this around the city and so over time you're doing and I which I thought this is great this is exactly what we were doing in Vietnam in 1965 basically the same thing moving villages providing security getting stability moving the village getting pride and security. that's the same thing we were doing in Vietnam so I came back to Mo I was all pumped up I got all excited with this and I came back and for the last 10 years I've been advocating for it. if you go on my website you can you can see all the, the visuals all the information for it um, but the main idea is the city didn't want to do it Mike Murphy wanted to do it Flynn did not because Flynn is a traditional chief of police and one of the things he dreads is <clears throat> what would be the term um, diluting <coughs> his force by spreading them out in these little local police stations. He doesn't want to do that. In his mind, it's the worst thing you could possibly do. In my mind, it's the best thing. We have proof we have. So I've been advocating this for years. I've been part of a group of <laughs> police officers that think it's a good idea. And um, I don't know, maybe I'll die and someone will do it again. I think the idea is still full, fully viable. So my embeddedness in the community is such <clears throat> that you know what do I want to do I want to make the community safe I but I don't want to be an alderman and you know because I'm too old for that now so I want to do what I want to do oh by the way I'm 72 which means from the standpoint of which when you're dealing with 72 year old people they're going to do what they want to do <laughs> so okay I guess your work with the police department is really interesting to me, um, and I know that, um, or at least I guess I went into this neighborhood with the notion that um, there are some tensions between the police force and the community as mm -hmm. a whole. Um, do you believe that that's a widespread thing, or is that just some people? And what do you think can be done, I guess, to bridge that? Well, it's okay. Let, let's think about this. It's it's. I usually will answer a question like that and say it's systemic. It's built into yeah. the system. Now let's think about how the system works. Um, police departments generally see police districts as experimental zones. The chief of police right now in Milwaukee sees the, that the district police and specifically the district captain can be tested in each of these districts. The average time a, a captain of police runs a district in Milwaukee probably is about two or three years, and then they rotate out. So for the cops, the, the okay, your line officers remain can remain very stable for long periods of time. But like any business, labor remains stable, but management changes. And when you change management in a, um, a very traditional type of organization, like a police department, they, it takes time to get a realignment into what the new boss wants because that policing system is a top-down, hierarchical mm -hmm. uh, command and control system. It isn't like a business where people can run around with their heads cut off and just ignore management. You can't ignore management in a police department. So the problem is 
if you get a good police captain, that police captain can just revitalize a community because the, 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 the function of the police captain, you can view it on a continuum. The continuum is, I'm in a, the lower end of the continuum is, I'm a manager, I'm going to make all our T's are crossed, all our I's are dotted, and everybody's going to stand by procedure, so on and so forth. Or, on the other extreme, I'm going to be an innovator to see what we can do to leverage limited resources. And cops have, police departments have very limited resources. How we're going to leverage limited resources in cooperation with the community I am the chief of. Because these are like, seven districts are like a little police department. And so if you get a good captain, it's great. If you get a bad captain, it's bad. If you get a captain in the middle, it's hard to adjust. And so what you what you have, okay, that's just policing. So that your silo is your the department. That's dependent on leadership. It's dependent on the mix of people within the district. And you have to remember that the police, police departments tend to um, draw individuals who are action-oriented, male or female, they're action-oriented. Uh, and one of the issues with that is that this department is very young. The, it, it, most of the policing literature will say, in order to be just a supervisor, a sergeant, you probably should have been in a police department at least eight years. Uh, to be a, a, a functioning line officer, you should be in the department five to six years. It takes that long to really understand the, the job because it's not just the job, it's the community you serve and understand how to get along with people. It's very social science oriented, and most people don't understand that. Now, on the other side of the coin, there is the community. Uh, the community is made up of nonprofit organizations who are have been in the community for long periods of time. They operate under charters. They have boards of directors. They are grant funded. They have to conform to city needs. They're basic organizations, little businesses that function well or not well depending on their leadership. But the basic idea is they operate to improve the community. And then you have groups of people who all wish to influence what happens in the community. And that that can be, in the case of Sherman Park, the Boys and Girls Club, you start rattling off the names of, of this, which is, drives me crazy. You start rattling off the names of all the organizations that literally came out of the woodwork after the, I call it the kerfluffle in Sherman Park, after that problem occurred, which wasn't totally local people, it was people from the outside. Mm -hmm. the, the, everybody wants to serve youth. And so these people, it blossoms. All these organizations come out of the woodwork to serve youth but it's not uncoordinated. So you have, I, I also view it cyclical. There is a cyclical nature to what happens in these communities. Policing, I, I look at leadership changes on a four year cycle. Chiefs changes, departments change, people within the districts change. Um, nonprofits, their leadership tends to be more stable over long periods of time. Uh, Fred Curzon has been, you know, I think the executive director of SBCA now for 15 years. Here, she, he's retiring. We're in the interviewing process to get a new executive director, and I'm on the interviewing board. But the 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 other issue is all these other nonprofits, some of whom are okay. Then you have some of whom are very well led, some who aren't well led. Um, you have the issues of ego in these smaller organizations. You have founders who have certain visions that they want to do, which could be politically motivated uh, or not. Uh, you have individuals in those, those groups who are um, well versed to what's happening and are ignorance as stumps. And so you, you think of the, think of the gestalt, think of the whole peace as an interlocking, moving, systemic issue. And so the problem is Americans aren't good at seeing systemic issues. 
people without education are really bad at trying to understand complex complexity. And unfortunately, a lot of the problems that you have in these communities are people who are undereducated and are, are really not understanding the level of what needs to be done vis-a-vis -vis Donald Trump and the election and all the rest of this stuff. So, and you don't want to get me going on yeah. that. But the, the, you may personally, but I don't want to do that. Uh, but, the, the, but it does play out. Everybody right now is worried about grant funding. Everybody is worried about the, 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 the federal government is in an unstable, illogical, badly led quandary. And it hasn't figured out what it's going to do. And nobody has bit the bullet and said, no, we're not going to do this any further. So there, I don't know how long this is going to take, but what it means for all the nonprofits in the United States who are grant funded, everybody's worried about grants and aid. And, you know, where's the money coming from? Because we don't know what this Congress is going to do. So the, the, again, we go back to these issues, four-year cycles, eight-year cycles. These are things that occur all the time, and they do change. So, I mean, I always tell my, my students in my very classes, I teach business. And I said, if, if you're a business leader, you have to think in two-year cycles, four-year cycles, and eight-year cycles when you're talking about the federal government. Because if you change parties, everything changes. If you do money's thrown up in the air, no one knows we're funding, and, or it might be the app, you go, fat city, we got lots of money to do what we need to do. And that, the, the, the one thing that the American political system, de, de, democracy is very messy. And it's very messy because it is, it is hard to do long-term strategy and planning when the, the variables of the electorate can cause it that plan to change within a two-year cycle. Mm -hmm. So you're in a, I mean, in your business, think of architectural planning, think of what's your coding going to be, what are, you know, who's going to react to what, and all this, that's the cycle you've got. You must think in cycles. You cannot think of a continuum. Yeah. So I guess um, in relation to that, with coding, <coughs> and also back to what you were saying about Burleigh, another thing that we've heard from people is, um, resistance to businesses coming into the neighborhood. Um, what type of businesses? See, that's the thing, is they haven't really said, it seems to just be a general resistance to having anything other than like residential zoning in the area. And I'm wondering if you have any insight into where that fear might come from, if there's any, um, I, I if you think it would be good or bad for the neighborhood. All right, think of this. I, again, we go back to this continuum. I, I like use, I always like pegging my extremes first. The most desirable, think of Burleigh, the most desirable venue for Burleigh would be Brady Street. Really? What do, okay, let's think about Brady Street. Without getting into the aesthetics, but basically it's, a, it's surrounded by a, a pretty well-to-do community or a community that will draw. The businesses on Brady Street are upper level, upper middle class, trendy to a degree, restaurants, cafes, coffee places, so on and so forth. So the demographic they're appealing to, in all honesty, is primarily white, upper middle class, heavily female. And, uh, you know, the guys, okay, we got to go to coffee. Right. You can drag me, I guess. Um, and so the issues for that community reflect who lives there or who wants to live there. The problem when you think about Sherman Park is, okay, again, demographics. Demographics and geography drive everything. Demographically, what is, here, I'm going to ask you a question now. From your studies, what is the average age of residents in Sherman Park? Um, I don't think that I've had a great representation of Just the community guess. as a whole. But I've, most of the people that we've talked to have probably been in their 50s or older. Yeah. And then, yeah, so I would say that, yeah, I guess an older demographic. That's correct. It's either middle age or older middle age. Okay, yeah. so, so you've got a lot of older people who may have empty nesters. They may be empty nesters. Their kids probably have been raised 
uh, in the more affluent sections. Uh, so we, we are, Sherman Park is a community in transition because the older people are going to kick the bucket and die out. You've got to draw on younger people and you want to draw on people with kids. Okay, I, I did research with the police department on, on issues of residency, and I'll use that research for commenting that where do cops, here, I'll ask you a question. Where do cops live in Milwaukee? Fire people too, where do they live? Um, I'm not sure. Right around the edge of the city. Yeah. Right around the edge. And so to, and the analog I had to use because that information wasn't public, the analog I had to use was residency for school teachers. Everybody, civil servants, all live around the outer edge of the city. Sure. Do they live? Do, they used to live in Sherman Park, but because of perceptions of crime, there are mm -hmm. issues that aren't fully appreciated by people who don't understand residency. One of the problems with residency is if I'm a middle class family and I'm making a middle class income, maybe I'm making 40, 50, at the most 60K, and I'm living in the city, where am I going to send my kids to school? Yeah. And this is the constant recurring theme. Okay, I gotta send them to MPS. Now, MPS has some very fine schools. I'm on the advisory board for Washington, Washington High School. And it, it it's a good high school, but again, it has the same problems of perception. So I don't want my kids going to Milwaukee public schools because they're not very good. See, when I went to Chicago public schools, they were really good. But that was in the 1940s and 50s. And now we have the same thing here. I'm just a reflection of exactly the same feelings in Milwaukee. So the school system is the driver. The school system defines who is willing to live where. And so if you have younger people, millennials who want to live all close to all the bars, I mean, that, think of that as a stage of life. So that that's going to change. As soon as those millennials, think of my daughters, as soon as those millennials uh, start having kids, my kids are all extras, as soon as you start having kids, well, I guess we can't go out to the bar every night. We've got to take care of the little tykes. And so they start looking, where can we live? All right, so you, this is a good neighborhood to live in. I mean, from the standpoint of the physical geography of the community, it's a wonderful place. Where's the problem? Milwaukee Public Schools. And so, again, we go back to this thing. So the civil servants live around the edge where they can send their kids to suburban schools. Now, think of the cops. And for cops, this is a big issue. Firefighters is, my dad's a battalion chief with the Milwaukee Fire Department. That's great. They're nice people. They save lives. Cops. Eh, we hate cops. So the kids get stuck in, in a, a, a loop of having to defend their parents all the time or getting into fights. And, and being, being the son or daughter of a policeman is not necessarily a good thing. It's very hard on them. So the end result is that it's not the neighborhood, it's not the housing, and in many ways it's the school system that's diminishing the ability of the city to grow. And so when people get upset, you know, when you talk to people in your, your talks, I might ask questions, how do you feel about the public school system? And I think you could probably find a, a, a uh, what is the, the statistical phrase, causation. Um, one thing doesn't lead to Correlation. Does Correlation. Causation. Co yeah, and you sh should have had that pounded in your head. Um, the issue is, no, it's not necessarily true. The, but there are good public schools. And you notice something. I, it would be interesting doing a study like mm -hmm. the French immersion to look at the surrounding area, you know, a 10 block surrounding area to French immersion and see how many of the parents who live there send their kids to French immersion. So you have good schools, you have bad schools. The good schools and bad schools reflect the community as your solid state drive getting full now. That's what I was looking at. Yeah, we're about an hour and five minutes. So. We're about an hour and a half. Well, you don't have a 64 gig. <laughs> Okay, cool. <coughs> We're going to wipe it out when I get back. Later.
Well, of course you are. You're going to download it on the computer. And... That's incredibly interesting. Yeah, I talked to friends um, who live in the Milwaukee area, and everyone talks about going to Tosa or going to Shorewood when they start raising kids because you're still close, but you're not an NPS. That's the problem. That rings very true. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't blame them. It's I understand that. Your mothers and fathers want the best for their kids. I mean, we had the same. I had the same problem when we moved back to Chicago. Um, and uh, I think that was one of the reasons my marriage broke up, because the the my wife at that time didn't want the kids, and we we were sending our kids to public school for a while, and the schools that we sent them to were good schools, but she objected to that, and she wanted to move into the suburbs, and we didn't have. I was the only one working. We didn't have enough money. To buy a house in the suburbs, we upscaled within Chicago, within Beverly, but eventually she divorced, and now she she lived in a suburb and got all the girls going to a suburban system. That's fine, I, you know. The, but the the basic idea is this whole issue of education, and the venue education occurs within is very important. Catholic schools are basically pretty much all good. The Lutheran schools are pretty much pretty good. So the religious schools are good, but a lot of people, I don't particularly, you know, if a religious education should be an, uh, an education in philosophy and not an education necessarily in religion. So, uh, you know, I've taught at two Catholic institutions, and the people I love talking to are my nuns. I love the nuns. They're, they're super cool. I really like my nuns. Some of the priests, I go, eh, but the nuns are good. But generally speaking, the... The issue of education, I think, is the driver. If you, if you had a good influx of money and you, and you diminish the amount, here's the other thing. The public schools would work just fine if, if people quit meddling in them. And for, I'm sorry, suburban dilettantes to think that they can screw around with the public systems in the state, not just Milwaukee, and start experimenting with for-profit schools and think they can solve the problems. I know for a fact, and what is the fact I know? I work for a non-profit, or I work for a for-profit college. I work for Herzing. Um, and I rub shoulders with all these other for-profit people on a board level. And frankly, I'm going, I don't like this. I don't like it at all because, again, you know, nothing against capitalism and nothing against profit, but guess what? It shouldn't be the driver in education. So, the, you know, where am I personally on how to solve the problems with Milwaukee? I'd start with the school system. And I would start by really flushing and upgrading the, the making teaching truly a sought-after profession, pay it at a level that it should be, encourage men and women to be part of the system, minority men to be in the system fully because they can afford to be because they're paid at a level where they can raise a family, um, legislated in a way that the private schools don't have an advantage. You know, what they're doing at a federal level right now is insanity. Um, but that's because we have an insane president. <laughs> Uh, sorry, um, but but the the issues actually I think are relatively simple. The systemic nature of it can be manipulated. Think of a spider with a web. You can change the tension on the web in one area; it changes the whole web. If you can change the 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 validity and the function of the school system you probably are going to change the city. And right now, you know, I go back, what is, okay, Dr. Tom, what is your definition of politics? Okay, she'll save us. My, my definition of politics is, it is the art of using limited resources to meet or exceed unlimited demand. And that's basically what the city has to deal with. So, oh, because of doggy. All right. <laughs>
Yeah, she just yeah, said we were just saved from some some monster in the it's alley. Death. Okay. Wow. Um, Am I making sense? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. This is great. Um, amazing. Um, I was going to ask you what your visions were for Sherman Park moving forward, but it sounds like it stems a lot from the education system, oh, it, it, which I it's, completely agree with you on. Yeah, it's it's the okay. Well, no, you asked a question on new businesses. Oh yeah. All right. Think of. Th I'm going to use Burleigh as an example because I've thought, we've thought about this for a long period of time. And Judy, if Judy was here, actually, ten years ago she did planning. She was the research director for the Sherman Park Community Association. Mm -hmm. And the. If you look at, what's the anchor? What what holds that corridor down? St. Joe's. St. Joe's is recommitted. You know, Wheaton Franciscan says they're going to remain here. What is it known as? Well, it's the baby hospital of the city of Milwaukee. More than one person was was birthed there. But it 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 has a really excellent emergency medicine venue, and it is also probably strategically placed to provide community services for the whole north side of Milwaukee. Hospitals have been going away because, again, with instability and in funding and the need for hospitals uh, to serve uh, difficult communities, the response has been sporadic. But St. Joe's is, takes care of a lot of people who aren't very wealthy. The corridor of Burleigh from Sherman to 60th Street, if you do an audit of the buildings that are there, some are really nice buildings, some aren't. But if you look at the businesses, you go east, you, you go from about 48th and go east to 35th and just look at the businesses. They're uh, a bar, liquor store, um, nail shops here. All right. You instantly can look at a neighborhood, and when you see the dominant businesses are nails, hair, booze, you know that the, it's, a, it's a community with difficulty. And so the problem is actually Mayfair Mall. The problem is Amazon. The problem is the 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 change, the economic changes caused by the internet in some cases. I mean, I get my stuff through Amazon. Why do I have to drive all the way out to, you know, someplace to get what I need through Amazon? So you start thinking about the sustainability of local business. You may want local businesses, you know, like a, a, a chic scarf shop or something. I don't know. Again, who has, who controls the money? Women. I'm sorry, it isn't men. Women control the money, and the type of stores that, that are predominant are stores that attract women. And so, well, nails, <laughs> hair. I mean, there's a lot of black women who spent big chunks of change on clothing, hair, jewelry. This sort of, those stores appeal to them. But to the, to the mixed community, you know, to... If your community is white, Hmong, black, so on and so forth, it's a mixed community, the white people are probably going out to Mayfair or if they're going to go shopping or they'll go downtown. The, the, uh, the Hmong would go to, we have nice Vietnamese stores here and Asian commodities. I like a lot of that stuff. And so those stories are here. So the, the Burleigh serves the community. And if you accept the hypothesis that the stores reflect the community, then you can get a pretty good idea of who is in the community. And the orthodox, there's one Orthodox uh, grocery store on Burleigh, and they serve the Orthodox community. So the changes, you know, which is it? Does the business mix attract people, or does the people 
chicken and egg? Mm -hmm. Or do the people attract the businesses? Well, I'm going to go with the people attract the businesses. So a lot of the, the, the folks, it's amazing the number of people who own cars, okay, even though they're not very wealthy, but they do own cars. And so they travel all over the place, but people also shop where they feel the most comfortable. And so for the, for the short term, you know, they'll go to Kings or they'll go the, again, the community that is served by those stores are probably fine. So I think the, the problem is on this continuum. The perception is we want, we want to go to Greenfield. I want my community to look like Greenfield. It's not going to look like Greenfield, right? So it, 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 I love watching public TV, and I'll watch uh, the, oh, what's, what's his name? The guy who's the former, former comedian who does, and with Gerda, the tours of communities in Milwaukee, or in Wisconsin. Not sure. Oh, man, eh, no, I don't want to waste your time. Anyway, <laughs> go here. Uh, look it up, though. Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah. When you get back, get on a computer. Look, go to PBS. Um, just input. Uh, uh, well, look Look for Gerda. Look for, I can't think of it. I'm blanking out. It's just, it's what happens when you get older. It's just, eh, it's not coming. <laughs> um all these communities that people refer to, suburban communities and small, Baraboo, I'm familiar with Baraboo, Partyville, start rattling off the names, or bike trails, we go biking. So all the bike trails in the state, all these communities that are connected by bike trails, you know, they're lovely, absolutely lovely communities. But that's not what you're going to find here. It, it's, it's just different. You have to accept what the community is and see how you can improve it given who's resident in the community. Um, if you don't, what was that? I think um, we're at a minute uh, 18, so we should probably start wrapping things up. Okay, sure. Um, Caitlin, was there anything, any other questions that you wanted to add? Um, I wrote some stuff down, but we... Do you want to just switch the tape over your thing? Or? Um, no, um, the interviews are like around an hour, hour okay. and a half. Okay, okay, So, sure. I mean, we're going to just um, ask any, if you have anything else. Yeah, do you want to add anything on? No, if you want to ask me stuff. <laughs> sure. I just quickly wanted to ask you, um, just bringing it home for a minute. Um, you have a beautiful garden. It's incredible. And no, you, Judy I, has a beautiful garden. Judy has a beautiful I garden. I kill plants. That's Judy. No, <laughs> sure. that's Judy's um, garden. I can tell a lot of work went into it, and you obviously really like spending time out here because this is the place that you chose for us to conduct the oh, interview. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering, um, just because that's something I'm interested in, too, if you could tell me a little bit of, I mean, what was the motivation for putting so much effort into having a beautiful Judy, garden, and why do you like Judy, out here? This is Judy. Judy's, uh, this was about four years ago. We talked about this, and I could actually send you pictures before and after. What we started doing was we this flagstone made a flagstone circle out here, and we put up a round tent, mm -hmm. you know, like a party tent. And we did that for a while, and we said, Judy said, I want a real pavilion. I want like a you know like a Chinese pavilion. And so we go okay, and so. She popped for I, she popped for X amount of dollars, and then I popped for Y amount of dollars, and we had the the guy that built that platform up there, is a very good carpenter. We had him come in and his his buddy come in and sink the post because I wasn't physically able to do that anymore. Dig the hole, sink the post, put the roof up, shingle it, and then she designed it. She drew out what she wanted in it. And then we figured out how we could make it work. And then she and I did this work together. Uh, I did almost all the carpentry, and she guided me. It's beautiful. It's absolutely incredible. Um, 
love it. We're definitely going to take some pictures of it, if that's all right. Oh, I, 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 you know, I could send you pictures. I would love that. If you could send me the pictures you give of what me it looks a, like before and you, after, that yeah, would be Yeah, you amazing. give me the email, and I'll, sure. I'll send you pictures. I would love that. So yeah. You can scan the show you too, like on my laptop. Either way. Um, well, if you want to go on the, the, how, what's your next appointment? Oh, it's, um, it's not until really, for one day. One, I think, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll, do that um, <coughs> unless there's, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us before we are done recording? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to do this. If I can add anything else later, fine. Of course, yeah, that would be wonderful, actually. I have no um, problem talking to, to you. I'd talking to you. Um, Okay, well, I think I forgot at the beginning to, rudely, to introduce my recordist. Uh, Kaylin Reed was here with us today, keeping track of the sound levels. Again, my name is Stephanie Gieslin, and I'm here with Dr. Tom Liffendahl. Very um, good. Uh, here on 50th Street in, in Sher Sherman Park. Um, Do you notice the flags out front? No. You'll see this weird, you'll see, uh, you will see an American flag and a flag from Oland, which is not Swedish. I it's know not Oland. A... I'm Finnish. And Oland. Ah! Yeah, I know Oland. Shake hand. I've met the president of Oland ah, in well. Alaska. She's a wonderful woman. Yes, <laughs> I know. I know. Lots of. President of Oland or the president no, of, I mean, I don't know of Finland? No, I don't know if it's the president, but no, of, of Oland. Um, the, I don't know what they call her. I don't think they say president. Well, they have a parliament. The, they have their own parliament. Yeah. yeah. But she's a. Yeah, I met her. Yes. She's great. <laughs> I was. I went and saw all my cousins. I Liffendals are all over the place. Wow. Liebendals or Liffendals. Yeah. In Mary Hammond, if you know where Mary Hammond mm -hmm. is. <laughs> so if you if you went to Helsinki, all right. I love doing this because people don't know where Oland is. So you got Helsinki, uh -huh. right? You got Stockholm, right? You got the Baltic, uh -huh. right? You got a bunch of islands right in the middle between Stock or Helsinki and Stockholm. That's the Oland Islands. Uh -huh. A L A N D. And the, the Olanders are all ethnic Swedes. Don't ever tell them they're Finnish. They're ethnic Swedes who were forced by the League of Nations after the First World War to make it to become part of Finland and they be and why? because the Oland Islands are in the continental shelf of Finland, not Sweden. But because the, the grumpy Olanders, and that's what I like about it, I love that. Mm -hmm. The grumpy Olanders say, we are not Finns, we are Swedes. Our, our language is Swedish. We don't, we don't even like, and they don't, they like, don't like speaking Finnish because it's so hard to speak. And so they, they cut a deal with the Finnish government, they're an autonomous province of Finland, which would be like the UP being free of Michigan. Right. <laughs> they're an auto autonomous province of, of Finland, their own parliament. The only thing they don't do is, and it's a, it is a nuclear armed forces free zone. No military resides there. The only thing that's there is poli a police department. And so policing uh, their the uniforms are Finnish uniforms, but they're basically Olanders yeah. or Finns. And the, um, the parliament is a self-governing parliament. And you can go all the way back to Viking parliaments. The, the early Norse way of governance is, is still alive in Oland and in Iceland and the Shetland Islands. And I'm so into this. I really am. My, uh, my grandmother lives in Helsinki, but she's a Swedish-speaking Finn. Um, See? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. And actually, where she was born, um, Lake Ladoga, I think, or yeah. is, is now part of Russia. It's no longer part of Finnish territory. Right, because so they lost Swedish territory. Speaking, she's, a, she's, a, she's a, you know, ethnic Swede, Swedish-speaking Finn who lives in a part, or was born in a part of Finland that's no longer Finland. Yep. And she's, a, she's actually a historian. She spends a lot of time in the archives, but... She's she's an art historian, but also just a, a Finnish historian in general, and she is pretty close friends with. I I, I hate that I'm blanking on her name, but Helga Holunska. Yeah, yeah, head of head of something, something. in, in Oland, a very important person yeah. in the government yes. of Oland, and yeah, it's yeah. fascinating stuff. My 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 first cousin Robert Lewandahl is a, a theatrical person. Can't wear off that thing. 
Uh, let me show you. Go to Facebook. And see if I can get. With my luck. There. See. Okay. You just start. This is all my the stuff I get from my cousins. Oh wow. And you can do translations. Translations. Very cool. And then I have this too. I have cousins in Finland who post things, and I have to click the read translation.